particularly when we think about mass incarceration. Uh, we had this huge crime wave in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Murder went way, way up. Armed robbery, assault, all of it went up. There's a tremendous amount of crime in heavily African-American communities. And, and things like the crime bill and the harsher sentencing measures, they passed with support from African-American elected officials, from African-American activist groups. There's this famous quote from Jesse Jackson where he says that it's his great shame that when he hears footsteps behind him at night, he is comforted when he turns around and it's a white man. There's a way of looking at this that it's about racism, and then there's a way of looking at this that, that there was a real crime problem that had somewhat mysterious origins and somewhat mysterious uh, reasons for its decline, but that the explanation is there, and this sort of new view of it, that it's all implicit bias and it's all racism, is, is ahistorical. Mm-hmm. So I'm, uh, just to make sure I'm understanding your question, you're saying the new view is that it's implicit that, that, bias. That, that the conversation we're having mm-hmm. does not account for the context in which a lot of these bills were passed. They were not. They were passed with a lot of support from the black community. They were seen as protective of a black community that in some ways was under-policed um, and that was often the victim of huge, huge crime waves. Right. And so there can be a, a version of this where it looks like it was all done unto, but there was also agency here. How do you think about that? How do you think about that? This, this that is period? what I think about that period. Um, you're right. You know, a lot of the crime that was going on was going on in predominantly black communities, right? Were you the the drug crimes, the violence as a result of those drug crimes were going on in black communities. So you had the black caucus when those that terrible crime bill was passed, supporting it. Uh, because they thought at the time that they were doing something to protect the black communities. I think the problem with that crime bill and so many of those those crime bills that were passed even on the state level was that they were passed without any information, without any evidence, without any hearings, right? So the problem with these bills was that there was no research done to show what would be the impact of passing these bills on those communities, right? Um, At the time— no one could predict, and and some of the what we would consider to be very progressive members of the Black Caucus supported it, did not realize at the time when they were passing these bills that had mandatory minimum sentences and all of that, that it would result in the huge racial disparities that it produced, right? I don't think there was an awareness that, um, I think a lot of people when they were passing mandatory minimum sentences, they, they thought this will this will make it fair because we've got all these judges and the judges have all this discretion. And when when there's a white defendant before them, they're giving them a break and they're not giving a black defendant a break. Now everybody's going to be treated the same. And so this is going to bring equality and it's going to bring fairness. So you had sort of this weird alliance between people on the left and the right saying for different reasons, deciding they wanted these mandatory minimum sentences as well. What happened was it didn't get rid of discretion. It simply transferred that that discretion from uh, judges to prosecutors. And now prosecutors could decide, as they always had, but now they had even more tools and more ammunition to do this, whether to charge and what to charge the person with. And the plea bargaining power, which we haven't talked about at all. Prosecutors, when they decide to charge, they also have the power to offer what's called plea plea offers. And right, so they have a tremendous amount of discretion. So they can pile on all of these charges, these mandatory minimum offenses. A defendant facing 10, 20, 30 mandatory years in prison to life, maybe more, is of course going to feel incredible pressure to, to get out of that. And so a prosecutor will say, I'll tell you what, I'll drop three of these 10-year mandatory minimums if you plead guilty to one. A person facing that kind of time is, even if they're not guilty or even if they have a defense, they're probably going to take that plea because going to trial is risky business. If they go to trial, they'll be convicted of all of those offenses and they'll spend the rest of their lives in prison. This has happened. There's so many stories about about that happening. And so what happened was the power was transferred to prosecutors They would make these plea offers. 95% of all cases in our criminal justice system are resolved by way of guilty pleas. People think all these trials are going on. They're watching Law and Order and seeing trials. There are not a lot of trials going on. There's a lot of people pleading guilty because they're facing these incredible, incredible amounts of time in prison. So my point is this. I think it happened at that time because no one could predict where we would end up. And then decades later, I think 
people were looking back saying we're not any safer, right? Um, you know, people well, hasn't crime dropped a lot? Crime has dropped, but if you talk to criminologists, they'll tell you there's a real complicated mixture of reasons why crime is, has dropped. It's certainly not just higher sentences, and most will tell you it's not just this. It's a combination of economic reasons, the economy, a lot of different reasons come together because crime goes up and down, you know, if you look historically. And there's complicated reasons for that. But if you look at, you know, just just mandatory minimum sentences, no one will tell you that, you know, that's why crime dropped, especially when you look at all the negative consequences as a result of that, right? Lives being thrown away for years, the collateral consequences, families being destroyed, you know, people not being able to reenter society. So if you look at those, all the harm, certainly there's no comparison. So I guess my point is that people are now looking back and you had— you had President Clinton not quite apologizing for his role in, in you know, the crime bill. Not quite, not quite enough of an apology, but acknowledging that it was a mistake. You had Hillary Clinton saying that. But you also have African-American legislators who, who now are looking back saying that was a mistake. And that's why when, we, when legislators pass these laws, they need to be careful to look at the impact, the racial impact of it, and, and other impacts as well. And that didn't happen. And now we're paying the price.